Welcome to another edition of the Educational AD. Welcome back everyone to the Educational AD podcast. Our guest today is a good friend, Tal Gropp. He's the uh, athletic director at the Timberline High School in Idaho. Tal, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, Jake. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I've listened to a bunch of your podcasts previously and uh, you know, it's great to hear what ADs across the country are doing. Oh, we're excited to hear what's going on in uh, the Rocky Mountains. Uh, as you know, we uh, know athletic directors' lives are very busy, so we're going to jump right into it. Tell our listeners a little bit about you, uh, where you grew up, where you went to school and college, and, and maybe how your love for athletics got you that first teaching and coaching job. I was born and raised right here in Boise, Idaho. And uh, I have three older brothers. They're quite a bit older than me, uh, 12, 10, and seven years older. So I, I grew up basically chasing them around. They were big into athletics, football, and basketball, and track. And so I did a lot of those things when I was younger. Uh, I absolutely loved being involved uh, from, a, from an early age. And um, as I grew older, I, I kind of focused my efforts more on basketball uh, and ran some cross country in, in high school. Uh, I still loved being involved with uh, athletics. You know, I, I went to just about every sporting event I could through the high school experience. And, and then um, in, in college, I didn't participate in, in athletics outside of uh, intramurals. But while I was in college, I started coaching back at my high school, uh, coaching basketball. I coached the sophomore B basketball team uh, while I was still getting my degree and uh, kind of worked my way through coaching while I was there until I graduated and started working where I'm at still today, Timberline, in 2000. Uh, when I first started, I was a math teacher and coached basketball. Um, I was a JV coach for most of that time. And then an opportunity developed where I became the assistant athletic director while I was coaching. And I worked under uh, an athletic director at the time. His name was Brian Walker. And and I, I grew to kind of enjoy and appreciate, you know, I started doing that just basically to get an extra paycheck, but uh, I grew, I grew to kind of love that portion. I, I always thought I was going to be a head varsity boys basketball coach, um, but this opportunity presented itself sooner and I jumped at it. And in our district, you don't really get the chance to do both. So um, in um, 2004, Sorry, 2006, I took over as the athletic director here at Timberline High School. So I've been one school for 20 years, and I've absolutely loved uh, the experience of being able to be a part of it. Wow. Uh, I, I'm always kind of envious of uh, ADs that have uh, been at one school for such a long time. Um, in our business, we always talk about the importance of leadership, of mentorship, who have been some of the mentors uh, for you along the way, maybe as uh, coaches or as bosses, that you can still hear their voice um, in the things that you do each day? Yeah, I'd start with my dad. Um, you know, from an early age, he, he was right there with me, helping me get through a lot of things. Uh, I, had, I had tremendous coaches along the way, too, but um, I think that they all kind of me meld together for me. Um, you know, I, I don't, I can't say that there's one that really jumped out at me as, as I went through it. You know, I appreciated every coach that I had along the way. I don't think, you know, we speak about coaches who can have positive and negative impacts. And I think all of my coaches along the way were positive impacts. Um, you know, I think um, there's, there's a time and a place for maybe that old school mentality that I appreciate um, that a lot of the young kids today don't appreciate. We've kind of moved away from some of that coaching and, and um, which is fine. It's great. I think uh, kids today need to have, and I, and I think uh, statistically speaking, that it shows that if we're positive and we present a, um, a program in which is going to develop and grow kids instead of tear them down, it's going to be so much better for them. And I really feel like I had coaches that did that for me. Um, my dad still to this day, we, we connect quite a bit. He's, um, you know, he's 70 eight and he's still doing additions on his house that I go and help him with and when I renovate my house he's he's right there helping me make sure I get things done correctly so it's nice to have him still here and and somebody I can connect with on a on a weekly basis. No, that's that's great to hear. You kind of talked about the next area I want to go into um, you know you've been an athletic director for 
uh, a long time now, uh, but you've also been at the same school. What are some of the changes that, that you've seen in the day-to-day -day routine of an athletic director? And maybe what are um, one or two changes that you have helped initiate at your school that you're really proud of? Yeah, so I think initially, like if you just think about it, digitally we've changed a whole a whole gamut, right? So when I first started coaching, we didn't really have to deal with a lot of websites or Twitter or you know Instagram or any of that kind of stuff, uh, Facebook, trying to get information out in in ways now through email and everything like that is so much different than when I first started. So that's a big change that's taken place. I think though, in terms of coaching, uh, you really see a shift from and, and I mentioned this just a minute ago, but a shift from, you know, tearing kids down to really trying to build them up and get them in a position where they feel confident and, and secure in, in the position that they have, whether that is somebody that sits on the bench or somebody that plays every minute of the game. And, you know, coaches have a really hard time of trying to, to balance everything that they have to do. If you think about high school coaches compared to maybe college or pro coaches, high school coaches have to do so much more than any of those other levels because they're in charge of that communication they're in charge of setting up the gym or they're in charge of whatever it takes to get things ready for their day they're also in charge of developing their assistant coaches they're in charge of uh, communicating with administration taking inventory uh, and, and all of those pieces you know a lot of new brand new head coaches all they want to do is coach um, and, and that's a great, that's great. You know, if that's what you want to do, you're probably never going to be a head coach in the high school level. So uh, you got to learn to do all of those other things. And I, and I know that our coaches have done a really good job of trying to develop themselves as individuals, as people, so that we put that model in front of us that we're, we're good people. We're, we're developing better players, better athletes. And one of the things that we've done here at the school that um, I'm, I'm pretty proud of is, We've created, there's two, there's two programs really. We've created what's called the Wolfpack Advisory Council, where we take um, athletes from every sport. It doesn't have to be the captains, it doesn't have to be the, the star athletes, but it's kids who are leaders in their group that can take the skill development that we provide and take it back to their program. And um, I think that this has helped us kind of unify and become more structured as a school so that we're supportive of every program, not just the one in which we're involved in. And I think it's also helped our coaches to kind of come together as well. Um, the second thing that uh, I think that we're, we're still working on is just trying to get coaches to mentor one another, you know, the, the veteran coaches in the building to mentor the younger, newer coaches and try and get them um, to understand all of the pieces that are involved, the financial pieces that they have to take care of and, and uh, how to communicate better with, with parents so that, you can share with them what you're doing without feeling like you're giving away all of your information. Um, Cause coaches can be kind of, they kind of hold a lot of things to themselves and they don't want to give up too much. But um, I think those two things are really kind of helping our school to develop better school pride. And, and uh, you know, we've seen a shift and I think it's, uh, it's helping us quite a bit. Yeah. Very, very cool. Um, another point we'd like to uh, share with our listeners. A lot of them are young ADs. Um, is how to get involved at the state and hopefully even at the national level. Um, you know, kind of share the process of how you uh, got involved with your state association and, and now to where you're currently involved uh, at the national level. Yeah, I think from the very beginning, ADs need to realize that they're not alone because we are a group that shares so well. We share better than coaches do. We really care about developing and mentoring each other. And sometimes even, you know, in my case, like it's, it's hard to remember that I, I need to reach out to the brand new ADs. And so I think if new ADs can realize, hey, that, that I've got help out there. So it starts really locally, trying to make sure within your own conference that you connect with other athletic directors, but then also try and get involved at the state level as early and, and as often as possible. I think that there's so many opportunities for ADs to learn and grow. Uh, at their fingertips that are provided by the national level, but it trickles down into the state level because that's where it's, it, it initially starts with our young ADs. And I think if they can learn at an early part of their career that they have help, that they have people who are interested in them succeeding, because, you know, I know as a, as a conference, 
it's tough when we get new ADs every year and it happens because ADs, it's a, it's a tough job. So people, uh, I think if we can reach out and, and shepherd them in a little bit, then they'll stay longer and it helps us all, you know, I think if you have like two or three ADs who have been around for a long time, um, and then they end up having to do most everything because new ADs need some training. They need to understand how to manage a game and deal with some of those things. So I, I'm, I'm a firm believer that um, if we want to have our conference, our state, our national level to succeed and thrive, we need to, to really develop those young ADs and give them as many opportunities as we can. Let's go and talk about uh, COVID because um... – you know, it's still here. And uh, you and I spoke a little bit before. Um, certainly, we've seen a different response across the country. Uh, different states are uh, having different uh, reactions. Some states are delaying. Some states are full speed ahead. Uh, just looking at Idaho, um, you know, what's happening in your state, what's happening in your, your conference regarding, um, let's say, summer conditioning and uh, possible reopening. Our state is so unique, Jake, because we've got areas around the, the state who are vastly not affected at all by COVID. So there's a number of communities and cities that have zero cases. And so for, and we're also a state that has more small schools, like we're classified 1A through 5A. We have um, probably, oh, I don't know, I, I don't know the exact percentage, but I would say the large vast majority of our schools let's say we have 160, I would say uh, about 120 of them are at the 3A level and lower. So our 4A, 5A schools consist of only about 40 schools. And that's where the, the 4A, 5A schools are primarily in the larger populated areas. And so um, if you think about it, like 120 of our schools really aren't being affected all that much by COVID. And in fact, there's still some 4A, 5A schools in parts of the state that have not had a, um, a big problem with it. So it makes it tough as a state organization to say, hey, we're, we're going to do something for everybody the same. Um, in our area specifically, I live in Boise, so that's the, one of the largest populated areas in, in Idaho. And so we're sitting at a, what we call stage three right now in the Boise area, the Ada, Ada County. Um, stage three puts us at um, having functions that are at 50 people or less. And our school board just recently suggested that if we are still in state, not our school board, I'm sorry, our central district health, which is covers uh, most of Ada County, they have um, kind of said that it's probably a good idea that if we are still in stage three, that we don't open school doors on, on August 17th. So we're slated to start sports on August 10th, but if we don't have school in session on August 17th, I don't know what that's going to look like. Uh, that's not been determined. For us in our area, we shut down in the middle of June, towards the end of June, um, any sort of uh, activities at our school. Before that, we had had some weight training and some, some conditioning and some workouts taking place in our gyms and in our weight rooms and out on the field. And for the most part, you know, at the school sites, we didn't really have a lot of cases taking place, but there was just enough concern that they wanted to try and get us, they call it, get us to August 10th. Um, that we shut down summer activities in our area with the hope that on August 10th we could start up uh, full bore. Uh, around the state, though, there's been a lot of areas which continue to, to have summer activities, and they've been doing just fine. They're following protocols. They're keeping the weight rooms and the, and the gym areas clean, uh, disinfected. They have the kids on, you know, checking temperatures as they come in, maybe not every time, but once in a while, and and uh, making sure they're sanitizing their hands and, and taking breaks so that they can wash their hands. And, you know, we've got a plans in place for what's going to happen on August 10th. And I think that they, I think they'll keep us safe. I think the biggest worry is the fear that's out there from the community and the fact that what might take place when they're away from our facilities and what it might do to bring it back to the facilities and back to families. So I think we've got a great plan in place from a Southern Idaho conference plan, but will we be able to enact it? Uh, and is there too much fear out there for us to even give it a chance? You know, I don't, I don't know. We'll not find out probably till August 3rd. And, and that might even change between August 3rd and August 10th. 
What's been the uh, feeling from your own uh, community, you know, the, the kids, the coaches, the parents, uh, and even the teachers, you know, um, you know, what are their thoughts regarding, you know, uh, return to play? Yeah, it's hard to speak for all of them because, you know, obviously I can't see them as much as I used to, but I can tell you this much. We've got probably 50 of our football kids who, since we can't work out, they've just gotten together and done workouts together. We have a senior leadership group that's kind of just taken it by the, the bull by the horns and just said, hey, we're going to get this going and we're going to stay actively involved. And some people in the community are upset with us as a school because they are doing this on their own. Um, even though we have no control over what kids and parents decide to let their kid, you know, their families do. And, and um, we've had the same thing with some cross country kids and um, some soccer kids. And so the general feeling I get, I have a son who's going to be a sophomore at our school and, you know, he just wants to play. Like he, he is ready to get back out there and, and all of his friends feel the same way. Like now, you know, I've told him this, I said, you've not actually been affected by seeing somebody who's gotten sick. You know, none of your friends or family or anyone we know has been sick, but there are people out there who have had direct contact with those things and, and it does affect them. And so you just got to be aware of that. And I, my hope is, is that we start and that we give it a chance, that we give the kids an opportunity. You know, I would hate to see another season loss. Um, there's a lot of factors to it, but for me, you know, beyond like revenue and all that, all of that, to me, it's more about just getting these kids, especially these seniors, a chance to have a season. And if that means we cut it down, cut it in half, I know my coaches, they've said, we'll do whatever it takes to get out there. If you want us to wear a mask, if you want us to take, you know, have four hour practices, take breaks every 15 minutes, you know, we just want to get out there with our kids. I know I've heard from some, some staff members that they're concerned about coming back in the classroom. And, you know, I can't begrudge them for that. I just would hope that we could have precautions in place that they feel safe enough to come and that we can make it work because the kids need it. Um, if you look, statistically, there's a number, I, I don't know the exact number, but there's a number of kids who just cannot function online. And, and it's a large number of kids. And we do them a big disservice. Now, granted, there's some kids who will do great. They'll thrive with it. They love it. But they can do that. I mean, we, our school district has set it up so you can choose if you go in person or if you go online. If you don't feel yeah. comfortable coming to school, then go ahead and go online. Uh, but, you know, I'm scared. I think that there's a good chance that they won't even give us the in-person op option. We'll soon see. Yeah, we just, uh, at our school, um, um, we release the final schedule as far as, um, you know, in-person, on-campus instruction versus uh, virtual. I think we have just a little less than 10% of our families, and this is K through 12 because we're a private school, um, are going with the virtual route. So it's something we're going to have to deal with. Let's go and shift gears a little bit. Um, what are some of the favorite parts of your job? What gets you excited about getting up in the morning and uh, going to work each day? You know, I think for me, game day. I love game day, man. I, I don't care what sport it is. I just want to go and watch kids compete. And, you know, I love being with kids and coaches and working with them. But, man, when it comes to the actual day of an event, and, you know, when we're in the middle of fall season, that means we have a game every day. So that makes my job enjoyable because there's something to, to look forward to at the end of that day. And I, I just really appreciate competition and what it does for kids. And you can really see the growth that they have as they get to get to compete. And, you know, that's one of the things I'm most concerned with is that kids won't have this opportunity to learn and grow and develop leadership skills that they gain only from being in competition and, and seeing, you know, suffering defeat and the thrill of victory. And I think both of those things really help shape and mold so many people. I, I know as I look back on my high school experience, I remember most of my memories come surrounded activities. I have some memories while I was in school and, and some teachers, but for the most part, like they come from after school activities and the experiences I was able to have um, really shaped and molded who I am today. And I know that that's the case for all the kids that have a chance to be a part of these tremendous activities that we offer. 
And so that's what I'm most concerned with is, is not being able to have that. So that, that's what I love. I love seeing kids and coaches compete and do it the right way. Mm-hmm. Great stuff. Um, one more question before we uh, kind of move into our wrap up. Uh, this last uh, spring, in addition to COVID, we also saw uh, an increased awareness, uh, tremendous, uh, with regards to social issues. Um, I've been asking our guests, from your perspective, your community, or even just generally, what are some things that we can do as athletic directors, as leaders, to do a better job of uh, addressing these social issues uh, with our kids and our communities? Yeah, that's a good question, Jake. I think that uh, initially we've just got to be in front of it. We've got we've got to talk about it. Um, communication with with our community is is key, and and uh, you know I, I I suffer with some of this my in my own home. You know, my my kids. I, it's a new world. Like I never had to deal with kids being on their. You know, I was never on my phone. I didn't have a phone that I could carry around and have instant access to information. And I think socially speaking. Um, that phones and instant access to information, good or bad, uh, can really adversely affect these people mentally. And, you know, especially young kids, I think that they're at a moment in their lives where they have, um, their minds are being shaped in such a way that we don't fully understand. And so I think it's important that we just explain to them, hey, for us as a school and as, a, as an athletic department, we want to make sure that kids understand their role and that they need to try and push away outside forces that kind of shape who they sh- they could become and say, hey, we can build this on our own. And that's what our coaches uh, are being trained to do. That they can work with the kids and train them and give them those leadership skills that they need so that they are ready to, to tackle and handle some of this instant, you know, feedback that they're getting uh, that we didn't necessarily have to deal with. Like we, we get the newspaper the next day or maybe the nightly news, but like, you know, you have people in the, in the stands just sending something out immediately about a kid or about a team, and, and it can uh, adversely affect them right away. Mm-hmm. No, great, great point. Well, Tom, our final segment we call the Athletic Director's Toolbox. Uh, as we said, you're a veteran AD, an award-winning AD, and now you're being tasked with sending out a brand-new athletic director to their very first job, but I'm only gonna let you put three things in their toolbox. What three items are gonna go in Tallgrop's toolbox? Yeah, so number one, I kind of mentioned this earlier, I think I would tell every AD to get involved, right? So that means locally, at the state level, nationally, go to NADC, go and take as many classes as you can. Um, And that's kind of part of my number two, and that is to, uh, you know, keep learning. Uh, you know, I think I've taken over 25 classes and in every NADC, I come away with something new. Um, we're in a position, Jake, that we're, we're lucky enough to listen to CMAA projects. And I come away from every one of those presentations or projects I receive and say, that's awesome. I'm going to take that and start using it at my school. Now, not everybody has that opportunity, but I wouldn't get that opportunity if I wasn't involved at the national level by joining the certification committee and being a part of helping others. It's funny because you look back on your career, you can say the same thing, I'm sure. First year was tough because you didn't know what you were doing. You were learning a whole bunch of stuff. Okay, so I'm starting year 15, and I would say 15 is way tougher. I can't just sail through because what happens is the job grows. You, You don't just, you know, they give you a lot of passes that first year. Nobody gives you a pass anymore. They're expecting that you're not only taking care of what you were supposed to do at the base level, but now you're involved, you know, uh, on the state level, you're involved at the national level, and they expect that you're going to have the answers to a lot of what we're doing. And so I'm not trying to scare new ADs. I think that you just need to understand that if you get more involved, then you have a bigger um, group of people that can help you get through your duties and understand what you're supposed to be doing. And to help with that, this is my third, that is to delegate your duties. I think if you can work with your coaches, come up with ways, you know, across the country, some ADs have secretaries, some have assistant ADs, some have neither. But you all have a coaching staff. 
that you can use to help delegate some of your responsibilities, uh, things that, you know, they can take care of, they can handle on their own, and that will free up you to take care of the important pieces. That is, in my opinion, you know, coaching coaches and getting our kids in a position where they feel loved and respected um, by the coaches. And if we can use those pieces, you know, get involved, understand that you have a lot of learning opportunities, get connected, and delegate your duties, you're going to stay for a much longer period of time and you're going to enjoy this, this job so much more. Because I know my connections across the country and across the state are what keep me motivated now um, beyond just the competition and the, and the players and coaches that I have in the building. I love the, the camaraderie and the way in which we get to connect across this great country. And the NIAAA has done an amazing job of making sure that ADs feel important and that they have a resource out there for themselves. Uh, a absolutely. I agree 100%. You know, uh, just uh, uh, getting to know you, you know, a uh, guy from Idaho, I'm from Florida, you know, our, uh, our director, Pete, up in New York. Uh, okay, you know, we never would have crossed paths if it hadn't been for getting involved with uh, our state and then our, the national organization. Well, thank you, sir, for being a, a guest. Uh, always a pleasure seeing you and talking with you. Looking forward to uh, seeing you um, in September, uh, probably through Zoom at our uh, state coordinators meeting, and then hopefully in person uh, in December uh, when you come down to Tampa. Yeah, looking forward to it, Jake, and uh, looking forward to some sunny weather in December when we come down to see you. And thanks for doing this. I'm sure it is across the the country who get a chance to listen or, or gaining some good insight. So appreciate you putting this together. Oh, well, thank you. We're, we're having fun. And uh, again, we, we hope it's been helpful. Well, thank you, sir. Thanks to our listeners for tuning in. Come back again next time for another edition of the Educational AD.